thanks for coming along. I'm afraid that th this might go on, go on a bit. Uh, originally, it, it's, uh, it was a talk I gave for one of my holidays that, that I'll lead on Jane Austen. Um, but like Topsy, it's grown and grown. So uh, if, if you feel like grown and groaning in an hour's time, you can always leave us and, and pick up in, uh, on YouTube. Um, I will kick off though, uh, so we get started. This is um, uh, Jane Austen, as played by Kira Knightley in the uh, 2005 film. Um, and this was the only picture I could get of a cat. Uh, and as we're going to talk about um, uh, Jane Austen's Nine Lives, that would seem to be appropriate. Uh, though the subtitle is actually Jane Austen's Shinbone, as you'll see. That's the, the picture of Jane Austen we all recognise, we all know and love. Uh, and it's obviously about this lady who was born on the 16th of December, 1775, and died on the 18th of July, 1817, when she was uh, 41. Uh, it's an image we're familiar with in Britain because of the £10 note. Um, it's uh, the, the, the face of the £10 note. The, the figure in green, by the way, you see there, is supposed to be Elizabeth Bennet, uh, though looking just like Kira Knightley, I'd say, if you look hard enough. But the £10 note image is based on the image on the left, which is a painting by a man called uh, James Andrews, uh, which he did in 1869. And it was based on an earlier picture by uh, Cassandra, uh, Jane's sister, which some people have said uh, makes her look like she is sucking lemons. So that's the picture on the right. But we do actually know that's an original picture. Uh, the Andrews portrait, that's the one, that's the size that it was originally, uh, was for the biography which her nephew James Edward Austen Lee wrote in 1869. Um, and it, it may be a bit of an improvement on the one that Cassandra did. Um, and once they did a full-blown watercolour sketch, this is what the, uh, it came out as. And again, I think uh, you'd agree it's, it's, it's much improved. Um, this, these, though, are the only two real pictures we, we can guarantee are of Jane Austen. And they're both uh, done by Cassandra, her sister, one from the front and one from the back. Uh, this silhouette on the left-hand side is supposed to be uh, uh, pretty accurate. We think that that's Jane Austen, and the one on the right as well uh, is Cassandra, her sister. So you've got Jane Austen and her sister, Cassandra. And that one, which always looks to me like she's got a flower pot on her head, is known as the Byrne uh, portrait. It's from uh, that is the esteemed biographer of Austen uh, and scholar Paula Byrne, and it came to light in 2011. It's on vellum, it's uh, in pencil, and the view from the window appears to be uh, Westminster Abbey, uh, where Austin would have visited her brother Henry on trips to London. So it's, it's possibly uh, correct. But if you don't like that one, there's always some um, Melissa Little's waxwork. And that's the one which is in the Bath Museum or Bath, if you prefer. Um, and it's a representation by Melissa Little, uh, who was a, a forensic police scientist uh, for the UK and the USA, and was created uh, from contemporary descriptive accounts from Jane's brothers. And you can find that in the Bath or the Bath Museum. Um, Jane Austen's writing though was, was admired by lots and lots of people. On the right hand side, you've, you've got uh, uh, Tennyson who compared her to Shakespeare. Uh, in the middle, you've got Charles Darwin who was surprised on the voyage of the Beagle to discover that Captain Fitzroy Larky was a big fan of Jane Austen. Um, further over in, in the corner on the left, you've got Winston Churchill, uh, and he, he had Pride and Prejudice read to him at the height of the war and said what calm lives they had, those people. No worries about the French Revolution or the crashing struggle of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, he said it was read to him from the end of his bed, but knowing Churchill was pro probably read to him while he was in the bath, or bath for that matter. Um, and finally, in the corner on the, at the left is uh, the, the author P.D. James, who was a real fan of Jane Austen and insisted to Austen scholar John Milan that Emma was the best thing in the whole of literature ever written. And then we've got Virginia Woolf, who, who said this, anyone who has the, the temerity to write about Jane Austen is aware of two facts. First, that of all the great writers, she is the most difficult to catch in the act of greatness. And second, that there are 25 elderly gentlemen living in the neighborhood of London who resent any slight upon our genius as if it were an insult to the chastity of their aunts. 
Um, so perhaps you might want to consider what constitutes Jane Austen's greatness if there's time at the end of this discussion. Not everybody was a fan though. Uh, Madame de Stahle, um, she was a contemporary, a French speaking Swiss writer and a French emigr emigre from the terror um, whose writing Jane Austen admired, describe pride and prejudice as vulgar. You haven't lived love. Um, no wonder when the mo mo most famous contemporary author insists on meeting the author of Pride and Prejudice, Jane had the strength of character to refuse her. And then, of course, the most famous one, Charlotte Bronte, uh, said she lacked passion. In a, a letter to her publisher, uh, Williams, uh, she said uh, uh, she ruffles her reader by nothing vehement, disturbs him by nothing profound. The passions are perfectly unknown to her. Now, it's arguably if it hadn't been for Jane Austen, people like um, Charlotte Bronte wouldn't have been able to be published, but that's a, a different argument. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put the, uh, the, the full quotation uh, at the end of the presentation so people can pick it up on, on YouTube if they like. But the, the person who perhaps is um, um, uh, most notable in his criticism of Jane Austen is the gentleman there. And that is actually Mark Twain, about whom this, this talk gives its title. And here's a picture with uh, Jane Austen's very own skull and shin bone. That's a real, sh all right, perhaps it's not, but that's uh, Mark Twain. And what he said uh, in a letter in, in 1898 to, a, to his friend Joseph Twitchell was the following. Can I, uh, uh, oh, my American friends will mind if I have a go at this. I haven't for any right to criticize books and I don't do it except when I hate them. I often want to criticize Jane Austen, but her books madden me so that I can't conceal my frenzy from the reader. And therefore I have to stop every time I begin. And this is the best bit. Every time I read Pride and Prejudice, I want to dig her up and beat her over the skull with her own shin bone. And if you think, don't think that's bad enough, what about this one? He said, just the omission of Jane Austen's books alone would make a fairly good library out of a library that hadn't a book in it. And just in case, case there are any Edgar Allan Poe fans out there. I've offended all the Jane Austen ones. I don't think there are any Edgar Allan Poe fans, but it, if there were, then this would probably offend them. He, he said, um, to me, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's prose is unreadable, like Jane Austen's, uh, spelt like the million dollar man. No, there is a difference. I could read his prose on salary, but not Jane's. Jane is entirely impossible. It seems a great pity that they allowed her to die a natural death. Uh, so he wasn't a fan. So if you haven't yet turned your back on the screen and, or thrown something at it, it will be my attempt to challenge that opinion, at least by putting her life in, in context. Uh, there are those today who will tell you that Jane Austen is uh, Mills and Boone without the pilot, uh, Paul Dark without the pasties, Catherine Cookson without the stotty cakes, and Barbara Cartland without the rattle of jewellery. And I have to confess that as a callow youth, before my Pauline conversion, I also held those views, mea culpa. Uh, but I would now argue that a reading and a rereading of Austen really does make you believe that you are in the presence of greatness. So um, it's an introduction to Jane Austen in nine lives or in uh, nine books or nine pieces of writing. And the first of her nine lives uh, is this one. It's the, the Rice portrait, um, the famous portrait of a girl of 13 on the left-hand side, which is claimed to be Jane Austen as a child. Uh, the child on the right is her niece Fanny, who Austen adored, though Fanny was quite horrible to her when she was a bit older, uh, looking down upon her, I think. Jane began writing at the age of 11 and collected all her early works in three notebooks bought for her by her father. By the age of uh, 17, she had written something like 74,000 words and begun to draft her early novels. Interestingly, she still makes spelling mistakes, uh, so uh, love and friendship uh, has friendship with the I and the E uh, the wrong way around, which makes me, me feel better anyway. Um, but my favourite piece of her writing is this. Um, if you look at her early short stories, they're not what you might expect from a clergyman's daughter. So you've got murder, elopements, bigamy, suicide, drunken party goers, hanging, madness, and best of all, children biting off two of their, their mother's fingers in Henry and Eliza, uh, mostly written, you'd be glad to know, in a jokey way. Um, I particularly like, though, this uh, The History of England, which she wrote at the age of 15, and which her sister, Cassandra, illustrated. She's the, Cassandra's the CE, the Cassandra Elizabeth under each picture. 
uh, and it's written as a parody of one of uh, their schoolroom textbooks, The History of uh, Oliver Goldsmith, and it's a bit like 1066 and all that. You'll notice the two characters on the left, Henry V and Charles I, are, are in um, modern costume or contemporary costume, uh, whereas uh, uh, Elizabeth I and um, Mary Queen of Scots on the right, um, it, it, the same could be said of them as well. And, and it's, it's those two which I think are, are probably the most interesting. It, 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 Jane did say um, uh, that um, it was by a partial prejudiced and ignorant historian and there will be very few dates in this history. But inside you find these pictures. Cassandra seems to have modeled her kings and queens on people they knew. And apparently Jane Austen was a big fan of Mary Queen of Scots and disliked Elizabeth I. Uh, appropriately then, Mary Queen of Scots is modeled on Jane herself, while Elizabeth I is modeled on her mother, as you can see from the comparative pictures. Uh, suggesting perhaps the tension which existed between the two and which persisted later in life. Now, some mothers in Jane Austen, not all, but some, like Mrs. Bennet or Mrs. Bertram, do tend to be figures of ridicule. Here, Elizabeth I is described as a disgrace to humanity, the destroyer of all comfort, the deceitful betrayer of trust, in, trust reposed in her. Uh, maybe she really did hate Elizabeth I, or maybe 15-year-old Jane had just had a row with her mum that morning. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. This is uh, Steventon Rectory. This is where she was born on the 16th of December, 1775, the seventh child and second daughter of George Austen. He was an Oxford educated clergyman who was descended from wool manufacturers who had risen to the lower ranks of the landed gentry and had married Cassandra Lee, not rich herself, but with rich relations. The aristocratic Lee family owned Adelstrop House in Gloucestershire and Stoneley Abbey in Warwickshire. She was also a, a distant relative of the Duke of Chandos. George Austen had gone to St. John's College, Oxford. They had met and they'd married in Bath. They lived in this rectory in Steventon, described in 1870 by a first biographer, her, her nephew, James Edward Austen Lee, as a small rural village upon the chalk hills of North Hampshire, situated in a winding valley about seven miles from Basingstoke. And significantly within that house, Jane's father had a substantial library of 500 books. Now, if you go looking for the, the, the rectory today, this is what you'll find. That's it, that's it an empty field uh, where the story, three-story building used to be. Um, and you may notice in the middle there that there's a fence round what used to be the pump. There's the, uh, the tree, and again, you can see the, uh, the fence round what was the pump and a drawing of where the pump was, but that's really all that's left. If you look at the field, again, I'm, I'm giving you a beautiful picture of, of uh, uh, some, some uh, weeds growing up around a pump. And the, over on the other side of the hedge is, is another building, uh, the view of your new, the new rectory. Um, so the family considered themselves respectable gentry without money. Uh, George Austen, as well as being the local rector of two parishes, Steventon and Dean, took in boy boarders and taught them Greek and Latin one of whom, Tom Fowle, would later become his eldest daughter's fiance. He also farmed the glebe land that they had pigs and chickens. The fields are those where, like Catherine Morland, Jane would have played rounders and rolled down the hill. Opposite on the other side of the road, you see the rectory built by Jane's brother Edward in 1824, when the house was pulled down and his son William uh, took over the living. But you can follow the, the, the lane up and uh, come to the Church of St. Nicholas. I think we've mentioned about three churches in this talk, and they're all called St. Nicholas, but this is the one at Steventon, and it's just at, at the lane. And she would have known that intimately from the first 26 years of her life. If you go inside that church, you are able to um, purchase a, a card. And this is a card I, I bought from inside, of it, inside it. Um, it's set about the year 1783. It shows in silhouette, George and Cassandra at the front, uh, the Austin parents, of course, leading their family to church. So Jane is about eight years old. She is second from the end, holding the hand of a four-year-old brother, Charles, who's not yet breached. Uh, the three older boys at the top are James, 18, Edward, 16, Henry, 12, with Cassandra, 10, and Francis, 9, um, just ahead of them. Now, an interesting uh, silhouette, 
some of you may have realized one of the children is missing and that child is the one who's never mentioned that's george um the that was because george was an epileptic and probably deaf uh, so it is it, missed out of um, uh, of all the references uh, to, uh, to the family he was the second son born in 1766 so 17 at the time that that drawing was made. Um, so he was epileptic and probably deaf. And so was farmed out to another family in another Hampshire village from a very early age. He wasn't expected to live long, but in fact, he lived till the age of 72 and is buried in the churchyard of Sherborne St. John. By the standards of the day, he was treated humanely, but he was never visited and is never mentioned in any of the family letters. But Jane had six brothers, if we include George. Of these, her favourite was not the eldest and the brightest, James, who went to University of St. John's again, the richest, Edward, who we'll meet later, or the bravest, Francis and Charles, who joined the Navy and fought against Napoleon. Uh, but Henry, who's pictured there on the right-hand side, who was four years her senior, he became a soldier, a banker, until he, he and the bank went bankrupt. And it, uh, you can still see his bank if you drive down Alton or walk down Alton High Street. And then he became a clergyman. His most impressive achievement though, uh, apart from overseeing the publication of Jane's novels, was marrying the beautiful and talented Eliza Hancock, uh, or Eliza Countess de Ferilida, and Jane's favorite cousin. Now, when Jane was 15, she dedicated her short story, Love and Friendship, the one with the misspelling, to her. She was suspected of being the illegitimate daughter of Warren Hastings. George Austen's sister, Jane Austen's aunt, Philadelphia, had gone out to India on what is known as the fishing fleet. And she found a man there, a uh, Tyso Hancock, who was a surgeon for the East India Company. He had died the year that Jane Austen was born, um, but the child, uh, is supposed to be Warren Hastings rather than his. Anne Philadelphia and her daughter Eliza came to stay with the Austins in 1786, five years after Eliza had married one of Marie Antoinette's bodyguard who was later gu gu guillotined in the terror of 1794. So Eliza is supposed to be the model for Mary Crawford in Mansfield Park. She introduced the Austins to family theatricals uh, when Jane was an impressionable 11 year old. And Jane may not have written about the French Revolution, but she was certainly aware of it. So the first book, if you like, was the Juvenilia. The, the second one is, is one which I'm sure we all recognize by Jane Austen, uh, Sense and Sensibility. So Jane's second life and second piece of writing. This was the first novel to be published and was published in 1811 when she was 36 years old. Though it's a novel which she began when she was 19 and she initially called it Eleanor and Marianne. Uh, for a novel in this new romance genre, it was reasonably successful, earning her 100, 140 pounds, which is about 11,400 today. Uh, to get modern equivalents, it's uh, a good idea just to add a couple of zeros. It was originally an epistolary novel, as so many of the novels of the time were, uh, just like uh, her favorite authors, uh, one of her favorite authors, Samuel Richardson, uh, but much revised before publication, as all her novels were, which is why they're, they're such gems. As the title page suggests, it was published anonymously, as it would not be genteel for a lady to publish under her own name. And um, it was in the standard three volumes to meet the needs of the newly emerging lending libraries. Uh, it's set in, uh, it starts off in Norland Park in Sussex. And like all of Jane Austen's novels, its setting is the genteel world of the upper middle classes. Now, if you take out the housekeeper, Mrs. Reynolds, uh, uh, in Pride and Prejudice, there are only about 17 lines of servant's dialogue in all her novels. So I, th I think Poldock wins on, on that one, hands down. Like all her novels, Sense and Sensibility shows how women's lives are controlled by their dependence on the financial goodwill of others and the necessity to marry well. Not to do so risks the twin dangers of poverty outside marriage and misery within it. As Caroline Lucas says in her next novel, happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. 
And you only have to look at the Wickhams and Bertrams of this world to suspect that not all marriages are destined to end happily. So, as it says there, uh, the family of Dashwood had long been settled in Sussex, their estate was large and their residence was at Norland Park in the centre of their property where for many generations they had lived in so respectable a manner as to engage the general good opinion of their surrounding acquaintances. But when their protective uncle dies, Mrs Dashwood and her three daughters, we don't hear a lot about Margaret by the way, are forced to move to a small cottage in Devonshire because Norland Park, which was entailed, has been left to the son of a previous marriage and his awful wife. Already, the overwhelming importance of money, ownership and inheritance and their impact on social status and later courtship and relationships is made apparent. Without wealth or property, women are simply dependents, pawns in other people's games. And as Hilary Mantel said in, in Jane Austen, you can hear the clink of cash in every paragraph. Now, without giving the story away, though I imagine most of you know it, um, the two older sisters, Eleanor 19 and Marianne 16, represent on the one hand good judgment, governed by reason, sense, and on the other, emotionality, sensitivity. Though, of course, that's questionable by, by the end. As always in Austin, there's a dashing hero, a scheming female, and a predatory male. Here, the handsome Willoughby has just rescued 16-year-old Marianne and shock horror, he's carried her home. He's touched her. Austin caustically writes, his name, he replied, was Willoughby and his present home was at Allenham, from whence he hoped she would allow him the honour of calling tomorrow to inquire about Miss Dashwood. The honour was readily granted and he then departed to make himself still more interesting in the midst of a heavy rain. Eat your heart out, Colin Firth, in the wet shirt stakes then. This, I think, is just one example of Jane Austen's sharp satir satirical eye at the expense of what a Regency contemporaries would regard as her elders and betters. That's so often found in her novels and in her letters. Okay, I'm going to give the story away, so, so spoiler alert, put your things in your ears if you haven't read it. Uh, it's worth noting also that at the end of the novel, 16-year-old Marianne marries 36-year-old Colonel Brandon. Um, the happy ending of a, an Austin novel occurs when the girl becomes a daughter to her husband, an older and wiser man who has been her teacher and advisor. Discuss this assertion from Gilbert and Goober's The Mad Woman in the Attic. Uh, you can write your essay, but perhaps at the end rather than now. Um, and this is, is the, the, their bedroom at Chawton House. So it's a story about sisters. And Jane's closest sibling was, of course, her own sister, Cassandra, who was two years older. As a child, she would have shared a bed with her. And as an adult, she shared a small room in Chawton with two beds just like this. They would remain close throughout their lives. Cassandra, like Jane, never married. In her case, because in 1797, her fiancé, Tom Fowle, you remember I mentioned him before, had gone to Santo Domingo, which is the modern day Dominican Republic, as a regimental chaplain in order to earn enough money for them to marry. It was not to be, as he died of yellow fever and never returned. It's thanks to the many letters between Jane and Cassandra that we know so much of her life, though Cassandra destroyed many, many more of them, I suppose like, like Twitter or WhatsApp of its day. Now, as a child, uh, she, she, uh, Jane Austen was so attached to her sister that when uh, Cassandra was sent away to Mrs. Corley's school in Oxford, which is in the picture there, at the age of 10, eight-year-old Jane had to go with her. Mrs. Austen once said that um, uh, if Cassandra were going to have her head cut off, Jane would insist in sharing her fate. They were joined uh, at the Oxford school by their young cousin, Jane Cooper. So far, so good. But Mrs. Corley, who ran the school, decided to move the school to Southampton. And that's when the trouble started. Southampton was awash, or, or perhaps more likely not, with soldiers and sailors. And all three girls caught a putrid sore throat, the dreaded typhoid. Some people said typhus, but uh, others say typhoid, which is about the dirty water, of course, rather than the fleas. Unfortunately, Mrs. Corley had neglected to inform the parents, but somehow Jane Cooper smuggled a letter out and the parents dashed to Southampton to rescue their tender offspring. 
later when Jane was 14, um, she got a revenge on Southampton in her short story, Love and Friendship, uh, which contains, among other things, the warning above. Beware of the insipid vanities and idle dissipations of the metropolis of England. Beware of the unmeaning luxuries of Bath and of the stinking fish of Southampton. And apologies to anybody who lives in Southampton. Uh, so they, they, were, they went home, but um, all the three girls survived, but Mrs. Cooper, unfortunately, caught the disease from them and she died. That didn't stop the three girls being sent soon after to the Abbey School in Reading, uh, where Jane completed her education at the tender age of 11. And the picture there is, it, it, uh, this isn't the parents dashing to Southampton or, or another Brexit image. It's actually um, Jane Cooper. Uh, she grew up, she made a very good marriage, she became Lady Williams, um, but she was killed in, in a, an accident later in 1798 when her coach overturned. The third life, oh, we're on the third life already. Pride and Prejudice, Jane's next life and second uh, published novel. This was begun when she was only 21 and was originally entitled First Impressions, a good choice as it's a novel about people making snap judgments uh, which then have to be revised. The title Pride and Prejudice is thought to have been taken from the title of the final chapter of Cecilia, a book written by another of her favourite authors, Fanny Burney. Coincidentally, the first time we see Jane Austen's name in print is in a list of subscribers to Fanny Burney's Camilla, which is a, a, a bit like publishing by crowdfunding. As an 18 year old, her father must have been persuaded to pay, to, uh, pay the guinea required to have her name listed in the front of the first volume, along with a thousand others including Edmund Burke, Maria Edgeworth, and Radcliffe. And there along with those, those names is Miss J. Austen Steventon. Inter interestingly, Pride and Prejudice was rejected first by Cadell in 1797 when she was 22. It was marked declined by return of post and presumably not read. What a mistake to make her. Uh, before being accepted by the military publishers Edgerton better known at the time for publishing military maps. Now, the military connection came about through her favorite brother, Henry, who was instrumental in getting it published. In 1793, Henry had taken a break from his theological studies to join the Oxfordshire militia as then regimental paymaster. As such, he was in Brighton when the regiment were required to witness the public execution of two soldiers caught up in bread riots. While not the focus of her novels, this world existed at the periphery of Jane Austen's vision. And so it's not surprising that a novel like Pride and Prejudice should include many references to the Meryton militia and provides us not only with a not very reliable Colonel, Colonel Foster, but also with the villainous Lieutenant George Wickham. It would be an interesting quiz question to ask, in which Jane Austen novel do we have reference to a private being flogged? And it's actually in chapter 12, of Pride and Prejudice. Um, it's probably the, the best, best known uh, as a love story and, and for the, having the most famous line uh, in, uh, in literature. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Uh, this sets up the story of the love which emerges between the proud and brooding aristocrat, Fitzwilliam Darcy, and the spirited Elizabeth Bennet, who at first is prejudiced against him, though the title works on, on so many uh, different levels. And who could forget uh, all those comic characters from Elizabeth's silly younger sisters to a noisy and foolish but driven mother to an opt-out father, and above all to the obsequious Mr. Collins, uh, one of many clergymen in Austin who are held up to ridicule by this clergyman's daughter. It's no surprise that Mr. Collins has no time for novels, uh, but only conduct books for young women, such as Fordyce's sermons, while Mr. Darcy, as you'd expect, is a reader. And for those people who, who uh, um, can't have a Jane Austen talk with us without this picture, um, it wouldn't be complete without you know, Colin Firth. Uh, demonstrating the universal truth that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a pair of swimming trunks. 
looking at that picture, you, you uh, may also think it's, uh, it's a still from uh, a Pride and Prejudice adaptation, but you've been mistaken, of course. It's from the biopic of Jane Austen becoming Jane. And it's a reminder that Jane Austen also had a love life and a time of youthful exuberance from coming out at 16 until well into her 20s. She speaks in her letters of several hangovers and frequent balls where she was not short of suitors, as you'd expect. Um, the film tells the story of Jane Austen's love for a young Irish, newly graduated law student who Jane met during the 1795-96 Christmas season when she was just turned 20. He was staying with her friend and confidant, Mrs. Lefroy, at nearby Ash Rectory when Jane was living in Steventon. It's a private house, but you can go and um, stop outside and have a look if you like. And another place which you can see is they met, fell in love and attended several balls together, including nearby Dean House. Dean House. Her father was also the rector of Dean. She enjoyed uh, Tom's company, spoke about their shared love of Henry Fielding's Tom Jones and teased him about the white coat he wore. According to her family, Jane Austen's favourite novels were Samuel Richardson's Sir Charles Grandison, Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, Jonathan Swift's Girl of His Travels, and of course, Henry Fielding's Tom Jones. I'll let you skim through the, the, the letter there while I take a drink of water. But this was a, a drink that, uh, a drink, this was a letter that um, she wrote to Cassandra on the 10th of June, 1796. Sadly, their, their relationship wasn't um, meant to last. His parents were well off, didn't approve of his marrying a relatively penniless clergyman's daughter, and neither did Mrs. Lefroy. So um, Tom was summoned back to Ireland, where he immediately married a rich heiress. Though he did remember Jane fondly later in life and even called his own daughter after her. Uh, and this is Jane's uh, excited letter. Um, He's a great admirer of Tom Jones and therefore wears the same coloured clothes, I imagine, which he did when, did when he, he was wounded. But it wasn't the only love of her life. Tom Lefroy um, went back to Ireland. But in 1801, the 26-year-old Jane, uh, Jane Austen visited Sidmouth in Devon uh, with her family. And there, according to Cassandra, many years later, is where she fell in love again. This time with a young gentleman, most likely a clergyman. According to Cassandra, he was a man who was handsome, intelligent, and possessed of unusual charm. Unfortunately, he was also possessed of a short life. He died soon after they met. It's no surprise in Austen's novels that the seaside is always associated with love and romance. The following year, Jane did actually receive a proposal of marriage. Uh, she was nearly 27 and nearing that dangerous time for women in the Regency period when she might be left on the shelf. On the 2nd of December, 1802, two weeks before Jane's 27th birthday, she and Cassandra were visiting friends at Many Down House, not far from Basingstoke. This was a large mansion like other local houses, such as the Vine and Oakley Hall, where the Austens had friends and had often danced. The heir to the property was 21 years old, six years Jane's junior, he had the wonderful name of Harris Big Withers, uh, but that was probably the most appealing thing about him. He proposed to her and she said yes. As she lay in bed that night, she must have realized how she would now be set up for life with wealth and status and family. Yet the next morning, having slept on it, she got cold feet and made the socially embarrassing but brave and necessary decision to say no. Two years afterwards, Jane's rejection uh, of Big Withers, he married a cousin and eventually had 10 children. Worth noting perhaps that four of Jane's sisters-in-law would die in childbirth. Elizabeth married to her brother Edward died and Mary Gibson married to Francis both died after the birth of their 11th child. This too could have been Jane's fate. She chose instead her novels, which she always referred to as her children. She said of Sense and Sensibility, I can no more forget it than a mother can forget her suckling child. 
She embodied in life, as in literature, the words of advice she gave to Fanny, her favourite niece. Anything is to be preferred or endured rather than marrying without affection. That's why Lizzie Bennet refuses Darcy, at least at first, and why Fanny Price refuses Henry Crawford. And that's why Jane uh, Austen died a spinster. There's Ash House again, and there's the lady on horseback. Just to remind us that many down uh, part was uh, the, 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 the Harris Big Withers house, uh, house has long since been demolished. But you can still go back to Ash House, where, where she danced with Tom Lefroy, and it still stands. Uh, Madame Lefroy, uh, Jane's own Mrs. Russell from Persuasion, died when she fell from a horse on the 16th of December, 1804, Jane Austen's 29th birthday. Serves her right, say the militant wing of the Jane Austen Society, uh, but not me, of course. Uh, Madame Lefroy's son, Benjamin, would later marry Anna, uh, James Austen's daughter, and one of Jane's two favourite nieces, so that an Austen did eventually become a Lefroy. Next novel and next life for North Anger Abbey, another early novel, but one not finally published until after her death. Uh, it had been prepared for publication as early as 1803 and sold to a London publisher, Crosby & Co, for £10. They, however, hung on to the manuscript until Henry arranged for it to be brought back for the same sum in 1816. It was originally called Susan, uh, and as this uh, book cover suggests, it has something of the Gothic novel about it. In fact, Jane Austen was a great fan of Gothic novels, and this is Jane Austen's warm parody of the genre. It's also the place where you see the, uh, a most spirited defense uh, of the novel. Uh, in this moment of author authorial intrusion in the narrative at the end of chapter five, she mentions two more of her favorite authors, Fanny Burney, who wrote Cecilia, or Camilla, and Camilla rather, and Maria Edgeworth, who wrote Belinda. It is only a novel, it is only Cecilia or Camilla or Belinda, or in short, only some work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humour are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. Fanny Burney, as we have seen, was influential in her choice of title for Pride and Prejudice. Interestingly, it's possible that they met. Fanny Burney lived in Great Bookham, which is a great name for an author, isn't it? Uh, in Sussex, and was associated with Jane Austen's aunt and uncle. He was the vicar there, and Jane's aunt Cassandra had also had some success as a minor novelist. Like her cousin, uh, Elisa, uh, Fanny Burney had married a French exile from the Terror, a General d'Arblay. They'd met at Juniper Hall, where Madame de Stael had also found refuge at the foot of Box Hill. And it's when uh, Jane was staying with her uncle and aunt in Great Bookham that she would visit Box Hill, which would feature both in the Watsons uh, and Emma. Um, and while we're on the subject of the novel, I know there are some people who like Grimshaw, so there's a nice Grimshaw picture there on the left. Um, we have this spirited defense of Gothic novels, but we also get um, um, th this response from one of the most uh, awful creatures in, in, in Jane Austen, uh, the odious John Thorpe, who takes a fancy to her. And it's about the mysteries of uh, Udolpho, which he dis dismisses as, oh, I never read novels, and then uh, has him pretend that he's a fan of the fashionable Anne Radcliffe. Mrs. Radcliffe's an amusing, is amusing enough. Well, he doesn't know that she wrote The Mysteries of Udolpho. He was just dismissed. So it's the, um, the, the villains of the piece are the ones who, uh, who don't uh, read Gothic novels. Um, Henry Tilney, on the other hand, uh, Henry Tilney, who is um, uh, arguably the, uh, one of the, uh, Jane Austen's nicest um, heroes, uh, is a novel that the, the hero of the, no the North Anger Abbey defends both reading in general and the mysteries of Udolpho in particular. If the attractive Henry Tilney is an advocate for reading um, and can give a ringing endorsement to Gothic novels, she seems to be saying they can't be all that bad. So I'll just let you look. The person, be it gentleman or lady, was not pleasing a good novel, must be intolerably stupid. I've read all Mr. Radcliffe's works and most of them with great pleasure. The Mysteries of Udolpho, when I had once begun it, I could not lay down again. I remember finishing it in two days, my hair standing on end the whole time. So he's obviously a, a good guy because he reads. It is, of course, um, 
the, the love story of the young Catherine Morland, a tomboy in her youth, just like J Jane herself, and the clergyman Henry Tilney, arguably the nicest, as I've said, of, jo of uh, Jane Austen's male characters, certainly in contrast to the bombastic John Thorpe and um, Henry's bully of a father. Um, the story is set in Bath, where the naive young country girl Catherine is befriended by Isabella Thorpe, here played by the uh, wonderful Carrie Mulligan, who has her eye on, on Catherine's brother. The young and naive Catherine Morland revels in fashionable Bath, but Anne Elliot in persuasion, like Jane herself, was less enthusiastic. Bath, of course, was the fashionable spa town, the place to go for old Regency men to take the waters in the pump room and to play with cards. And for young Regency men and women to find a marriage partner uh, or to flirt. So it was that when Jane and Cassandra were still unmarried at the ancient age of 26 and 28 respectively, their father decided on his retirement that they would leave Steventon and move to Bath where he had met and married his wife. Jane wasn't very pleased. She's said to have fainted at the news. And there is the pump room or the entrance to it. And a bit further on the, the Roman baths and the abbey. Um, and the famous uh, Roman baths and the famous bath buns. Now uh, you can get those from Sally Lund's bakery, uh, which is now also a coffee shop. And Jane Austen was a big fan of the bath buns. Uh, but not much else about Bath. Now the places where they lived in Bath uh, varied. In 1801 the Austens first stayed with the wealthy Lee Perrow family, relatives on Jane Austen's mother's side at One Paragon uh, Buildings, before finding a substantial Georgian terrace house of their own at Four Sydney Place. It's the one on the top right. Um, from then onwards though their changing accommodation across Bath reflected the decline in their fortunes. On the 21st of January, 1805, George Austin suddenly died of an illness. This was a disaster for his wife and the two daughters. They moved to short-term accommodation, first in Gay Street in 1805, and then in the less salubrious, prostitute-infested Trim Street the following year, before deciding they had to leave. You may recognize um, the, the Gay Street because that's where the the museum is. 40 Gay Street is now the site of the Jane Austen Museum. Uh, there was a few, few doors down from the house in which they actually lived, which is number 25. But there again is the uh, um, Melissa Little um, waxwork of uh, Jane Austen. Now, we can't leave Bath without, without mentioning the scandal which had previously befallen Jane's aunt, Mrs. Jane Lee Perrow. In 1799, shortly after Jane's first visit to Bath, her wealthy and rather pompous aunt was arrested for shoplifting. It was possibly a trumped up charge designed to blackmail money out of her. It involved a card of silk, but the lady refused to bow to the pressure of her accuser. As a consequence, she was locked up in Ilchester jail, not necessarily in, in a cell like that, but you, you get to the, the, the idea. And eight months later, the trial was held. Jane's mother very generously offered to loan her Jane and Cassandra to keep her company while she was incarcerated, uh, but no doubt much to their relief, she turned down the kind offer. Uh, unfortunately, she was acquitted, so it's not as good a story as it might have been uh, as soon as the, as the case uh, came to trial. And the other thing about Bath um, is that apart from this unfinished book, The Watsons, Jane's writing seems to have dried up suggesting again that Bath was not a very inspiring place for her. Jane wrote about 80 pages, one of which we can see here, with its numerous crossings out. And if you wanted to buy that, you'd have to pay a million for it. That's what the Bodleian Library paid uh, recently. Again, it's one of those stories in, of three or four families in a country village, which is Jane Aust uh, Austen advised her niece Anna is a thing to work on. It's focused mainly on the Watsons, a, a clergyman's family, and the Osbournes, the local gentry. It's thought that Jane Austen began writing it in 1803, but gave the novel up because one of the main characters, a clergyman called Mr. Watson, was ill for much of the novel and was about to die. And this was too close to her own family situation at the time. 
And this is a quote from it. My father cannot provide for us. And it's very bad to grow old and be poor and laughed at, is, is what uh, the clergyman's daughter, Elizabeth, says to her younger sister in the novel. And those could well have been the words of Jane Austen herself in 1805. And then we come to the second novel where Bath features. So slightly out of sequence in terms of publication. Um, so Persuasion was a title given to the novel when it was published posthumously by Henry Austen in uh, 1818. And it's not too difficult to find some similarities with Jane's life. Uh, Anna Elliot had been 19 when she'd been persuaded by Mrs. Russell not to pursue a romantic attachment to a young naval officer, Frederick Wentworth. In the same way, Tom Refroy had perhaps been persuaded against a romantic attachment to the clergyman's daughter at Steventon. And now at 27, the age when Jane had newly arrived in Bath, Anne feels on the shelf a sentiment seemingly endorsed by her not too kind father, who says, a few years before Anne Elliot had been a very pretty girl, but her bloom had vanished early. And as even in its height, her father had found little to admire in her. With her father's death in 1805, the three Austin women became dependent on the goodwill of their relatives, passed around from brother to brother like parcels. Between 1806 and 1809, they were living in Southampton, sharing a rented house in Castle Square with the family of Francis Austin, who like his brother Charles had joined the Navy at the age of 12 and was rising through the ranks. So Jane, her sister Cassandra, along with their friend Martha Lloyd and their mother went to live with Mary, Francis' new wife. It was crowded and the roof leaked. Uh, in case you think, um, uh, uh, that, that Martha Lloyd's a bit of an interloper. Francis would later marry Martha Lloyd when Mary Gibson died, uh, while James, the eldest brother, had already married Mary Lloyd, her sister. So there was a family connect connection. Both Francis and Charles had joined the Navy, as I've said, at the age of 12, and both would, be, would end their careers uh, with a rise to the rank of Admiral, in Francis's case, and Vice Admiral, in Charles's case. Uh, by 1806, Francis was commanding the HMS Canopus at the Battle of San Domingo. And by 1811, Charles, who had married Fanny Palmer, the, the daughter of the governor of Bermuda in 1807, was captain of the frigate Cleopatra. Both missed Trafalgar, but were active in the Navy throughout the Napoleonic Wars and obviously supplied Jane with a lot of material for the two novels, Persuasion and Mansfield Park, where the Navy plays a role. Now, the, these were in, in the Chawton House Museum, or the Chawton Cottage Museum, I should say. Um, capturing, capturing an enemy ship could have its rewards. These amber crosses were purchased by Charles Austin for his sisters, Jane and Cassandra, out of prize money gained from the capture of a French ship. And this, as you probably know, is exactly what William, the sailor brother of Fanny Price, did for his sister in the next novel we'll look at, Mansfield Park. Life once again imitating art, or vice versa. And we cannot let the reference to the Navy and Mansfield Park pass without mentioning Jane Austen's very famous and very crude joke, please cover your ears, about rears and vices, uh, which she gives to Mary Crawford to say, but which I'm too innocent to understand and so I better pass over it. So there is, is, uh, is Lyme Regis and there is, is, is the assembled um, uh, uh, members of, uh, of the novel, Captain Wentworth, Harville, Benwick, Anne Elliot, the Musgroves, and Lady's married sister, Mary. Early one morning, they've gone to, to Lyme Regis for, for a, a romantic break. And before breakfast, early in the morning, they go out for a stroll along, along the cob. That's the Musgroves, Anne Elliot, and Captain Wentworth. They continue on their walk and come to a set of stairs. Louisa, she's a bit uh, young and foolish, insists on being jumped down then them by Captain Wentworth. And she enjoys the experience so much uh, when she gets down that uh, she insists on doing it again. Now, despite being advised not to, Louisa jumps a second time. Uh, Captain Wentworth fumbles his catch and she comes crashing down on the stone flags below. 
obviously he's not someone who you want in your cricket team. Good old Anne Elliott is the one who characteristically takes control while Captain Wentworth is still bemoaning his dropped catch. Now, as a consequence of the, of the novel, Granny Steps, as they're called, um, it became something of a tourist attraction. In fact, Tennyson, who is, as we've said, a big fan of the, of, of the Austins, um, came there to Lyme Regis on the 23rd of August, 1867, and he called on his friend Francis Palgrave of the Golden Treasury fame. Um, and he'd walked all the way from, from Bridport, nine miles away, but before eating, uh, he, he wanted to go out and explore. And rather than wanting to see where the Duke of Monmouth landed in 1685, which is, I'm sure, what we'd all want to see, um, he wanted to see the place where Louisa Musgrove fell and Captain Wentworth dropped his catch. Now, the line of quoted on, on the right-hand side is probably my favourite in the whole of Austin for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's typical of Austin's sometimes dark humour, but it's also because it's a good example of the technique which Austin pioneered and which is justly famous, the take technique of free indirect discourse, which I think is, is not always easy to find in a single sentence. Anyway, I'll read it to you, as it's my favorite. Um, Louisa has just fallen uh, and banged her head and her sister Henrietta has fainted. By this time, the report of the accident had spread among the workmen and boatmen of the cob and many were collected near them to be useful if wanted, at any rate, to enjoy the sight of a dead young lady. Nay, two dead young ladies, for it proved twice as fine as the first report. So in free indirect discourse, discourse it's as though the narrator is stepping in and out of a character's thoughts. The narrator takes on the interior voice of the character. In this way, we get inside the mind of the character, in this case, the, uh, the, the workman, take on their interior thought and get a sense of a private hidden self, such as you might get from a soliloquy in a play or, or a monologue in poetry. It's in free indirect discourse that it can be argued we catch Jane Austen in her greatness, and it's absolutely everywhere in her novels. Six, the sixth uh, life of um, Jane Austen and the third novel of Jane Austen's to be published in her lifetime. It was, of course, Mansfield Park, published in 1814. And although it was published uh, by a lady, uh, and not by her name, it sold out well, and within uh, six months, uh, all copies had been sold. It's the story of Fanny Price, the impoverished daughter of a woman who married for love and fell on hard times. Uh, and Fanny is therefore brought up by a wealthy relatives, the Bertrams, uh, who, apart from the dashing hero, actually he's, he's probably more, more, more of a respectful uh, clergyman than a dashing hero, Edmund Bertram, they are a pretty unadmirable lot. Fanny is made to feel her inferior social status and yet maintains the independence of spirit we admire so much in Austin's heroines. Some people don't like Fanny because she's a bit too upright and sober, but I do because she's the courage of her convictions and sticks to them in the face of cruelty, contempt, and rejection. I'm not sure, putting, spoiler alert again, I'm not sure if her marriage with Edmund is going to work out in the long term though. It always strikes me as a, a bit too shallow for her. But this is, is the uh, 2007 film where Billy Piper is Fanny Price. Like Northanger Abbey, Mansfield Park is named after a place and is set in Northamptonshire. Another huge mansion, Southerton, found in the novel is based on Stonely Abbey, the Austin Lee estate which Jane visited and the family might have inherited in 1806 uh, had not uh, uh, the, the Reverend Thomas Lee had a stronger claim. It's clear that the Bertrams make their money from a plantation in Antigua in the West Indies. and They would therefore have been, been slave owners. Interestingly, the villainous widowed aunt who takes a special interest in bullying Fanny into submission is called Mrs Norris, the name of a famous slave trainer trader and a slave owner. And she is in effect, in effect Fanny Price's overseer. And for people of Jane Austen's generation, the name Mansfield would have been associated with Lord Mansfield, the judge uh, in two landmark cases, which eventually led to the abolition of slavery, the Somerset case, 1772, 
which established the principle that a slave could not be removed from England against his will, and the Zong massacre of 1781, when slaves were dumped overboard so that the owners could claim insurance. Mansfield found the insurers not liable, though sadly nobody was prosecuted uh, for, for the killing. And you may have seen uh, this picture, um, and you may have heard, already heard of, uh, of Mansfield. If you've seen the film Bell or read the book by the, again, uh, Paula Byrne, the Austin scholar. Dido Bell, like Fanny Price, was a ward brought up by her great uncle, William Murray, who was the first Earl of Mansfield, the Lord Chief Justice we've just been talking about. Uh, she was brought up as a lady alongside her cousin, Elizabeth Murray at Goodwood House, where this painting can still be seen. Interestingly, Elizabeth Murray was a friend of Jane Austen's brother, Edward Austen Knight, and Jane met her several times at Godmersham in 1808, and even visited her at home in Eastwell Park, where she lived, so she would have known uh, the story of Bell. And who can deny it, it might well have informed uh, the writing of Mansfield Park. And this is, is Godmersham House in Kent. Um, and there's a picture of the £10 note there, uh, because the picture on, on the £10 note is of Godmersham Park. But how is, the, is it that her brother, only seven years older, ended up living in this huge mansion in Kent, while she, her mother and sister, were having to endure the stinking fish of Southampton? Um, well, the reason is because, as you probably know, um, Edwin Austin Knight was adopted. Like Fanny Price in Mansfield Park and Frank Churchill in Emma, he was taken by a wealthy but childless couple, Thomas and Catherine Knight. Now the Knights had already been patrons of the Austins because it was through them that George Austin had gained the patronage and the livings rather of Steventon and Dean. Childless themselves they obviously took a fancy to young Edward, the third eldest boy after James and George. He was pre presented to them at the age of 12, as this silhouette shows. He went with them on their honeymoon, which he did in those days, and was formally adopted at the age of 16. The only stipulation was that he took on the family name of Knight. And under this name, he inherited not only Godmersham and the Stevenson Estates, uh, where the family had grown up, but also where the Austin family had grown up, but also another mansion in Hampshire, in the village of Chawton. During their Bath and Southampton years, his mother and sisters uh, were frequent visitors. And this is the uh, substantial manor house near the village of Chawton in Hampshire, with its beautiful long drive. Um, and it was to Chawton that Jane Austen moved with her uh, uh, mother, with her sister, with uh, Martha Lloyd in 1809. And there's a, a, an aerial view of uh, Chawton House, a beautiful house to visit. And you can just see on, on the left-hand side of church, uh, that's a, a, the second St. Nicholas Church where we've seen. Um, and there's a contemporary picture uh, of the church again in the foreground with the house in the background. Uh, and that was um, um, print, printed, painted in 1809. Um, and that's where you will find that um, uh, both Cassandra uh, and uh, Cassandra the mother uh, was buried in 1827 and Cassandra the sister was buried in 1845. Um, so Edward Austin Knight must have felt a pang of guilt at the overcrowded rented house in Southampton uh, that they were living in and felt it time to make a generous gesture by finding a home for his mother, two sisters and their family friend Martha Lloyd. Oh, what a lovely place, except that um, he perhaps wasn't quite as generous though, as you might think, uh, because of, instead of giving them the luxurious mansion, they were installed instead in the village, in the former bailiff's cottage, uh, a former pub, half a mile and a 10 minute walk away. They arrived on the 8th of July, 1809, but who can resist a picture uh, of snow? Jane Austen was 33. That's the, the same picture in summer. Now, by my standards, this is still a lovely house, but for those with aspirations of gentility, it might seem a bit of a come down. It was by the village pond and damp, and next to the main uh, London to Winchester Road, so that their passengers could look into their dining room as the coaches rattled past. 
um, that's why they, they have the, the window built at the side there, which you can see in front of you. But it did have gardens uh, and it did have an orchard and they could employ servants. So, so much so that Jane Austen had her most creative years uh, when she was uh, at, at Chawton. She revised uh, the three novels she had written previously, completed three more and started her fourth in a glorious eight year period. Jane wrote a poem to Francis and his wife um, in celebration of their new move. And to be fair to Edward, he was not always a resident in Chawton, spending most of his time in Godmersham and letting Chawton out. And also Jane's letters do tell of many visits to the big house, uh, such as this one from a letter written uh, to a sister in 1814. I went up to the great house between three and four and dawdled away uh, an hour very comfortably. And the uh, former Bailey's cottage and pub uh, now at the Jane Austen Museum is still a lovely place to visit. Um, so this was Jane's home for the last eight years of her life. It was her job to make the tea and toast in the morning and to be in charge of the wine cupboards, so not too onerous. She was also required to entertain the nieces and nephews who were frequent visitors. All told, she had nine sisters-in-law and 22 nephews and nieces, so being an aunt was a full-time job. But she did have time to write. Um, there's the, the rickety table uh, that uh, she she was supposed to have uh, written on. She folded sheets of paper into four inch squares, what she metaphorically called two inches of ivory on which I worked with so fine a brush um, and started writing. Uh, rumor has it that um, the, the, the door had a squeak to it and she never mended it because she could then hide her writing, which is probably apocryphal uh, because uh, people, her family certainly knew she was a writer. Um, in the evenings, she would read extracts uh, to them and she would use their reactions to inform any revisions which she needed to, to be made. But the story of the squeaking door is one which has endured. Uh, she could play the piano, like so many of her own characters. She was a, an accomplished pianist. And the Chawton House Museum contained many of her music books, including one where she, you can see in her own handwriting how the soldiers are Jew has been changed to the sailors are Jew uh, for obvious reasons. And the museum also contains that beautiful shawl, uh, which is supposed to be been embroidered by Jane Austen, um, and the turquoise and gold ring, which was supposed to have been, uh, been supposed to have been, supposed to have, have belonged to her. Um, my, my, our American friends may, may well know that it was sold to Kelly Clarkson, who won the American Pop Idol uh, before an expert, export order uh, was placed on it. So it very nearly went to America, but it's now in, in the uh, Chawton House Museum or Chawton Cottage Museum. And finally, if, if we're talking about treasures, I, I must point out that this gentleman who's called um, Jeremy Knight, uh, who has the distinction of being related to Edward Austen Knight and to uh, Robert Emmett, as a matter of interest, the Irish patriot and orator. Um, and the house is indeed full of uh, Austen treasures. And if you ever go to um, um, the Chawton House or Chawton Cottage Museum, you may well see uh, the relative of um, uh, Jane Austen and uh, Edward Austen Knight uh, to show you around. Number seven. Now the last complete novel written at Chawton was Emma. It was published in 1816 by the more prestigious publishers you'll be able to see, John Murray. But again, it was published anonymously by a lady. This is Jane Austen's only novel set in Surrey. Um, and for those who, uh, like Ali McGraw, love is never having to say you're sorry. Isn't that what she said in Love Story? And there are plenty of potential Hatfields, the home of the Wood Houses, and Donwell Abbeys, the home of Mr. Knightley, with an easy, easy reach of the great Bookham home of Jane's aunt and uncle, whom we mentioned earlier. Great Bookham is a good candidate for the village of Highbury in Emma as well. I'll lead you, uh, let you read that wonderful quote well, I just have a drink. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence. 
and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. It's another very famous opening of a novel. And the use of the word seemed there, I think, is masterful. For despite all the advantages, the one thing she doesn't have and has to find is love. And perhaps the other thing is uh, to, to find out about herself. Um, when she has this, this uh, epiphany, this, this moment of realisation uh, on Box Hill. Like Marianne in Sense and Sensibility, oh, put your things in your ears again. Like Marianne in Sense and Sensibility, she ends up marrying an older man and father figure. Emma even finds it difficult to call him by his first name, George. It's a, it's a lovely novel. Along the way, we meet characters we love to hate. You've got the social climbing Mr. Elton, who, who proposes to it in a carriage. Um, and the uh, woman he marries, uh, the odious Miss Hawkins, who is also named after a slave owner. Um, characters we pity, like Mrs. Bates and Harriet Smith, and then the eponymous heroine who learns about herself. The Box Hill picnic shown above is one of the most memorable, memorable scenes of social embarrassment in the whole of literature. And the heroine's reflection on this, the opportunity for lots and lots of good examples of free indirect discourse as well, of course, as uh, self-knowledge. And so at the end of the talk, if there's time, um, do feel free to say one thing very clever, be it prose or verse, original or repeated, or two things moderately clever, or three things very dull indeed. Um, though, given the, this audience, I'm sure you are only capable uh, of the first of these. Now, Jane's novels were still being published anonymously by a lady but they were beginning to be noticed in literary circles and in the upper echelons of society. And it transpired that one of her admirers was none other than the Prince Regent who became George IV in 1820. In the autumn of 1815, Jane nursed her brother Henry at home in, in London when he was dangerously ill. Uh, one of the doctors who attended to him happened to be the Prince Regent's physician, uh, Dr. Bailey, who informed her that the Prince kept a set of her books in each of his houses. Uh, more than that, he must have told the prince, for she soon received an invitation to visit his library at Carlton House, where his librarian, uh, James Clark, went on to advise her what to write. He sent her a list of ideas and suggested she might want to write an historical romance, romance about the Coburg family, uh, which she laughingly rejected. And she invited him to dedicate her next book to the Prince Regent. Now, the problem with that was that uh, she hated him. Um, she hated him, they hated the prince because of his mistreatment of his estranged wife, Queen Caroline of Brunswick, and the neglect of their daughter, Princess Charlotte, who was that uh, little child uh, shown on the top left hand corner. Prince George preferred Mrs. Mrs. Fitzherbert, his secret first wife, and his mistresses, as Gilray frequently pointed out. However, uh, an, a royal invitation was the same as a royal command. And so the first edition of Emma contains this most obsequious dedication, which again, I'll let you read. Now, given her capacity for waspish put downs, we can't help but consider this to be, be tongue in cheek. As a person, we know that close family and friends talked about how she could be quick-witted and very funny. Jokes came oozing out of her, some family members recalled, and she was well-liked by her nieces and nephews. But we also know from her letters and from reports of other people that she could be cutting in her remarks and judgmental. While those who didn't know her well said that she could be standoffish and she was like a poker. The penultimate life of Jane Austen takes us to Sanditon. On the 27th of January, 1817, Jane Austen began her final novel, which she called The Brothers and which we know as Sanditon. She had by then already been suffering from the illness that would kill her six months later. She stopped writing on the 18th of March, 1817, with only 11 chapters completed, or about one fifth of the novel. It was only in 1925 that the manuscript we now have was published. Now, 
in the first chapter, we learn that it's set in a seaside resort called Sanditon that everybody has heard of. Um, the favorite for a young and rising bathing place, certainly the favorite spot of all that are to be found out along the coast of Sussex, the most favored by nature and promising to be the most chosen by man. Now, you may recall that um, uh, Jane Austen's, uh, um, uh, in, in her novels, uh, the it, seaside is very, very important. Here's, here's uh, Pride and Prejudice. In Lydia's imagination, a visit to Brighton comprised every possibility of earthly paradise. She saw with a creative eye of fantasy the streets of that gay bathing place covered with officers. She saw herself the object of attention to tens and to scores of them at present unknown. So, in Austin, seaside locations have always had associations with love, sex and romance. So you have Brighton for Lydia, Bennett and George, George Wickham in Pride and Prejudice. Actually, she, she goes there looking for a man and they elope from there. You've got Ramsgate for uh, Georgiana Darcy and George Wickham in the same novel. You've got Dawlish for Lucy Steele and Robert Ferrers. You've got Lyme Regis for the Musgroves in Persuasion and Weymouth for the Churchills and Emma. Though uh, Mr. Perry, the Woodhouse's apothecary, much prefers Cromer, uh, perhaps the only safe place where the seaside is not synonymous with a city of sin, a bit like Blackpool really. Sanderson might yet have proved to be a city of sin uh, and it's actually based on Worthing. Now if you've been to Worthing you may have uh, uh, come across Jane Austen's favourite Pizza Express uh, and it, it's there. James Austen's father died in January 1805 uh, but the following September Jane, her sister Cassandra um, and their friend Martha Lloyd uh, took Stanford Cottage, Warwick Street, Worthing, for at least a month uh, and may have stayed until after Christmas. This was between their time in Bath and their moving in with Francis's family in Southampton. Perhaps this, it was just a holiday or, or perhaps they were looking for some, somewhere to live. Either way, the cottage where they stayed is now a Peter Express and today it acknowledges its connection with Austin uh, etched on the internal glass windows. So if you fancy a pizza in Worthing, that must be the place to go to. Now in Britain, of late, we've had the Sanditon TV series. The story begins with a coach crash, but soon moves on to the rapidly growing new seaside resort of Sanditon. The main heroine is Charlotte Haywood. Uh, the heroine comes to Sanditon as a guest of the Parker family. Uh, entrepreneurs who are making the most of the development opportunities of the new resort. Uh, the most interesting character though is Miss Lamb. She's about 17, half a mulatto, chilly and tender, had a maid of her own, was to have the best room in the lodgings and was always of the first consequence in every plan of Mrs Griffiths. Lady Denham obviously has plans for her nephew Sir Edward to marry her. Miss Lamb is the most interesting character because uh, this would have been the first time that Jane Austen had introduced a black character from the West Indies into her novels. Uh, though sadly, it, she didn't um, get very far with it because of her illness. And this of course is Winchester Cathedral. After their stay in Wokeham, Wokeham, Woking, they moved to Southampton and then on to Chawton, where Jane spent the last eight years of her life. In 1816 and throughout 1817, Jane was plagued by illness. In March 1817, she stopped writing Sanditon and moved to Winchester to be nearer to the specialist. She'd only started in January. The specialist was called Dr. Giles Lyford and he'd been recommended for her. Winchester was also the home of her good friend, Elizabeth Heathcote, who was the sister of Harry Spigwithers of Manydown who we've met already, and they remain close friends. Elizabeth lived in the Cathedral Close, and through her influence, Jane was able to get a house in nearby College Street, which is next to Winchester College. And here she moved in April 1817. And that's the house uh, next door to Win Winchester College. Cassandra stayed with her, and she had frequent visits from her brothers James and Henry and James's wife Mary Lloyd and her friend Elizabeth Heathcote. 
Writing to a friend, Frances Tilson, on the 20th of May, 1817, she wrote, I live chiefly on the sofa, but I'm allowed to walk from one room to the other. Three days before her death, she wrote some humorous verses about the Winchester and, uh, Cathedral and St. Swithin, Saint Swithin, whose shrine is in the cathedral. She died in Cassandra's arms in the early hours of the 18th of July, 1817, and she was aged 41. Her funeral took place four days later, but as a woman, women were not allowed to attend, attend. Cassandra would have watched from this window as she made the short journey to Winchester Cathedral with her brothers Edward, Henry and Francis and her nephew James Edward. Cassandra later wrote, she was the son of my life, the gilder of every pleasure, the soother of every sorrow. I had not a thought concealed from her and it is as if I had lost a part of my very self. Now, there's still uncertainty about the cause of Jane Austen's death. Was it a recurrence of the typhus, if it, was, if it was typhus rather than typhoid, she suffered from as a child? Was it Addison's disease or was it Hodgkin's lymphoma or even possibly arsenic poisoning, poisoning from the medical prescriptions? In July 1964, the doctor published a diagnosis of her death in the British Journal, um, British Medical Journal wrote, Jane Austen did something more than write excellent novels. She also described the first recorded case of Addison's disease of the adrenal bodies. But the jury is still out on her diagnosis. She's actually buried uh, there in the North Isle of Winchester Cathedral uh, with a gravestone which mentions her status as the daughter of a clergyman, the benevolence of her heart the sweetness of her temper and the extraordinary endowments of her mind, but nothing about her literary achievements. There's a story that many years later, the, the vergers were confused as to why so many people wanted to visit this one obscure grave uh, in the whole of the cathedral. And when the um, biography written by, uh, uh, written by uh, her nephew was, um, uh, was published, uh, I've just had, I'm noticing my, I've got a low battery, so I better make sure I've switched on. Bear with me a second. That's looking more promising. Okay, so when the uh, um, uh, the biography uh, was published in 1869 by her, her nephew um, uh, uh, James Edward Austin, um, and it was it sold very well. Uh, it raised money for, for this plaque. And the, the plaque recognizes her and the flowers are all the time. Uh, and above it, there is uh, the window by Charles Kemp, the, which uh, contains lots of, um, of uh, Austin puns. So you've got St. Augustine there, because that's the pun on the name Austin, it's an alternative name. You've got St. John the Evangelist and David and the sons of Korah, who wrote the Gospels and also therefore, and, and the Psalms, and were also therefore best selling authors, just like Jane. Um, so you'd have to borrow Jacob's ladder to see all this because the window is rather high up. And then uh, the ninth life, uh, the final life, the afterlife. Uh, it would seem appropriate to begin with one of the most recent fil film adaptations of her novels. The film adaptation of a short epistolary novel created by Jane Austen at the age of 19. She liked it enough to make a second draft, but not enough to get it published. Now, you may never have heard of the film of Lady Susan, and that's because it was given a different title, Love and Friendship. You remember that as a 15-year-old, she dedicated her novella Love and Friendship, with a typical 15-year-old misspelling, to her favourite cousin, Eliza um, uh, the Furry Leader. It's the story of a horrible flirt, Lady Susan Vernon, who has an affair with a married man and then goes on to ingratiate herself with her naive brother-in-law, brother, um, brother Reginald de Courcy. Uh, perhaps Jane decided it was too racy for a lady to publish, and surely it's too racy for us, and sent Susan, Northanger Abbey, to the publishers instead. But her afterlife continues. It continues in all those films. It's only one example of Jane Austen's afterlife in film and television. In fact, the Jane Austen line, 
which was voted as the most romantic in film and television, and therefore by implication the, the whole literature, was uh, Hugh Grant as Edward Ferrers saying to Eleanor Dashwood, my heart is and always will be yours. But unfortunately, it's never actually said in the novel. But the, the, the films have um, uh, introduced Jane Austen to a whole new audience. And then, of course, there are all those people who have attempted to, uh, to better, uh, uh, to finish off the Watsons and Sanderton, which were unfinished. Many, many uh, um, examples of that. And then, of course, lots of spin off novels. Uh, such as uh, that Jay Knights who uh, will really enjoy. The, the, the one in the middle, Longbourn, it is one I, I, I particularly like myself, though I can't admit I've read the others. I certainly haven't read Sense and Sensibility and The Sea Monsters yet. Um, my favourite, though, is um, a, a guinea pig, Pride and Prejudice. That's probably just about my level. Uh, and then, of course, there's all those other spin-offs. There's those um, um, films which are based on Austin's story, and remake them for a modern audience, uh, whether made by uh, Hollywood or Bollywood, like Pride and, and Prejudice, uh, Clueless, Bridget Jones' Diary. And then uh, there's uh, uh, my favourite, which, which um, uh, I had to watch as part of my, my uh, research for, the, for when I did the original talk for this, and it's um, Pride and Prejudice and the Zombies, which I highly recommend. Uh, I think, by the way, it's, it's a film with two different endings, again, spoiler alert, two different endings where, where uh, Wickham uh, ends one way and then ends another. And I think I was the only one in the cinema who stayed to see both. Uh, but of course, you have to in the interests of, of research, don't you? And as if the films aren't enough, there are worldwide Jane Austen societies across the world where you can let your hair up and put on your favorite police and relive the Regency life as a fully fledged Jainite, which it is not necessarily a term, a term of, uh, of ridicule. Um, it was actually invented by Rudyard Kipling. And then money, back, back to the money. I mean, we know that she's on the 10 pound note. Uh, you you know, the line, I declare after all, there's no enjoyment in reading, which is a bit ironic really, because it's uh, spoken in Pride and Prejudice by Caroline Bingley, who doesn't read, but is only doing so to impress Darcy. But before it, it uh, came out in 2017, the, the Bank of England um, issued some five pound notes, each with a, a Jane Austen quotation on. And if you picked up one of these five pound notes, you would uh, get a 50,000 pound bonus. Uh, the quotations are, of course, though, priceless. Um, sadly, I think that they may all have been claimed by now, but you can still enjoy the quotations. If I loved you less. I might be able to talk about it more. Or to be fond of dancing was a certain step towards falling in love. Or a large income is the best recipe for happiness I ever heard of. Or I hope I never ridicule what is wise and good. Or you can travel to Basingstoke, which isn't far from, from uh, Many Down and, and the places associated with, like Oakley Hall, associated with uh, Jane Austen. And you can see that the, uh, that the relatively new statue uh, Jane Austen stood there in the marketplace, which I think you think is rather nice. Or you can go to the um, uh, the, the um, uh, Bath or Bath Museum and uh, see Melissa Little's um, rendition. Or you could go to uh, Chorton, which has got both the house and the cottage, and even uh, the village of Steventon, where the church uh, is still there. Or uh, you might just uh, want to uh, read her novels and they have been translated into more than 50, sorry, 40 languages. Uh, and a, a nice quote from Jane herself, I declare after all, there's no enjoyment like reading. How much sooner one tires of anything than a book. And the final slide. Now, um, here to end is a quotation, not from Jane Austen, but from Hazar Nafizi's Reading Lolita in Tehran an account of a book club in Iran set up uh, to allow young people to read the works of authors like Jane Austen. As an Afizi writes of Austen's heroines as followers, but the words could equally well apply to the young women who risked imprisonment to read Jane Austen in secret. These women, genteel and beautiful, 
are the rebels who say no to the choices made by silly mothers, incompetent fathers, that there are seldom any wise fathers in Jane Austen's novels, and the rigidly orthodox, orthodox society. They risk ostracism and poverty to gain love and companionship and to embrace that elusive goal at the heart of democracy, the right to choose. Elizabeth Bennet, refusing to, defy, uh, sorry, to defer to Mr. Darcy when he first proposes in Pride and Prejudice and standing up to Lady Catherine de Burr. Anne Elliot, visiting her poor friend rather than kowtowing to her rich relations as her father had insisted. Fanny Price, rejecting the advances of Henry Crawford. It may not be Mary Wollstonecraft, but neither are they neg negligible in a society where women were still legally the property of their husbands uh, once they were married and dependent on the goodwill of their relatives if they weren't. Strange to think of Twee Jane as subversive, isn't it? Or are her novels just a good read because they are so skillfully written and make us laugh? After all, novels are there to be enjoyed rather than analysed, aren't they? Though arguably, this adds to the pleasure. So, I'll leave it to you. Was Mark Twain right after all? I shall rest my case. <laughs>